We are in an incredible time. We can now collect data and all kinds of data in a fashion that's never been possible before. And in fact, that's going to be the theme of this talk, big data and health. Now, um, this will probably get me fired, but I think the way we do medicine now is all wrong. And that's what this next slide's all about. And in fact, let me find my pointer. Basically, if you think about it, most of the time you go to the doctor, it's because there's something wrong with you. You're sick, you're not feeling well, things aren't right. And if you think about it, so we, we tend to focus on illness. But in reality, what we should be doing is focusing on keeping people healthy. As such, medicine as we do it now is very reactive. We react to what's some illness that's going on as opposed to proactive. If you think about it, when you go to a doctor, they actually measure fairly few things. They might measure 10, 15, possibly 20 things in you. We have technologies now that will let us measure, as you'll see in a minute, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of things. Uh, we typically go to a doctor's office very rarely when you're healthy. Uh, I'm fine, no reason to go to a doctor. Um, but reality is you probably want to know when things are starting to happen long before they're symptomatic, so you might think about going to a physician much more frequently. And finally, if you think about it, the way we practice medicine is based on population averages. I'll show you an example in a minute. But really what we should be doing is basing medicine on you. And to illustrate this last point, you probably heard that the average temperature of a person is 98.6. There's actually an incredible spread of this. And there's a study published recently of about 3,000 people. Their average temperature for this group was 97.5. But what you'll see is a pretty big range from most people are between 94, and I can't quite read that. Oh, there it is, 99.1. But some people are as low as, 20, as 92 as their normal average. And others, this is just healthy people, others are 100. So what that means is if you walk into, if your normal temperature is 94, you walk into a doctor's office, and he measures you and said you're 98.6, you're fine, go home, everything's good. You can be sick as a dog, 2.6 degrees above your normal, and he just said, you're fine, go home. This is why we need to base these kinds of analyses, these kinds of measurements on you, not on the population average. So um, again, this is where I'd like to see us go. I forgot to mention that all of this, because behind that plant, is, is really focused on keeping people healthy, keeping you as an individual healthy. And this, I think, fits nicely with the big initiative going on here by the School of Medicine, the so-called precision health. Now, our health is dependent on many things. It's dependent on your DNA, and then all these various things you're exposed to in your lifestyle. So we call that the so-called exposome. So environmental exposures like pollen and pathogens, um, stress uh, can be, certainly affect your health. Uh, food and exercise certainly affect your health, and there's 10 activities out there that'll help guide you in healthy ways for this sort of thing. And we know intuitively that all these uh, do impact your health, but we'll see a world in the not so distant future where people will be born with their genome already sequenced, because you can actually now do that technically um, in a pregnant mom, understand the sequence of the fetus. Uh, and then we'd like to understand in what kinds of health contexts leads to what kinds of disease outcomes. That is to say, here's an example. If you're at high risk for Parkinson's, you probably should not be a pesticide worker because there's a high probability that will increase your chances of getting Parkinson's. Now, you may not want to be a pesticide worker anyway. That's a whole separate subject. But you especially don't want to be a pesticide worker if you're at high risk for Parkinson's. And this is the kind of information that will be possible in the future. And we're working on ways of collecting all the sorts of information. So just to illustrate this further, there has been, in fact, a revolution of various technologies going on that now let us collect lots of data about ourselves. Certainly, you've heard about these new sequencing technologies that let you decode your DNA. We have six billion bases, six billion letters, if you will, encoded in our DNA. And we can now decipher that for, for individuals for about $1,000. We pay, actually pay $850, in fact, to determine the sequence of a person. That means determining the order of those letters. And it lets you do other technologies as well. Perhaps quieter, but uh, equally powerful, there's a revolution going on in mass spectrometry. That's the instrument they have in airports. It detects when you have bomb chemicals on you. Uh, you can use that. We don't use it for bomb chemicals in my lab. We use it to detect 
uh, basically biological molecules in your blood and urine. And so we can detect thousands of those things now, not just the four or five things or ten things they measure in a physician's office. We can literally measure thousands with these latest instruments. Uh, and there's also a revolution going on, you may appreciate, the wearable space, the so devices, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So all these let you collect lots of data about yourselves. We actually can collect other kinds of data. There's electronic health records that have a lot of your information in. And uh, although we don't do it, there's some activity going on here at Stanford where you can actually learn about people's health by how they interact with social media, the webs they surf, how, they, uh, how you communicate in your email and such. And then, of course, you can collect other kinds of information about how you're shopping. I think, in fact, your credit card probably knows where you are right now, uh, for that matter. So we can pull all this kind of information together to better learn how to understand and manage your health. So a number of years ago, our lab actually decided to test this idea. Can we bring big data in to better improve health? This is a research project, but you will actually see how it can actually have um, I hope find some form of it ultimately into a clinic someday. So the idea is we measure tons of measurements. We measure 14 different ohms. Ohms are collections of molecules. So your genome is your collection of your DNA. And we do that. We measure that once. And then we measure your modified DNA. That's called your epigenome. You may have heard about that, epigenetics. We measure all your, as many molecules as possible. It's all your RNA, proteins. These are immune molecules called cytokines. We've been improving and, and detecting method, or improving methods for detecting all your metabolites. It's called your metabolome, all your lipids, lipidome, and so on and so forth. You may have heard about the microbiome, right? Have, how many of you have heard about the microbiome? Yeah, this crowd's, you guys are on top of it, all right? <laughs> your microbiome, right, you have more, 10 times more organisms in you and on you than are you. As you say, yeah, we have about 30, mil, 30 trillion human cells on us, but we have at least 10 trillion, or um, sorry, 100 trillion bacteria on us. So we're more bacteria than we are human, actually. Um, and a lot of that's in your gut and it digests your food. Very, very important for our health. And so basically, we literally make billions of measurements every time we, we see some. We also do standard clinical tests, uh, stress echoes. Then we do some extra fancy uh, tests that some of you may have had or know about. And we do have wearables. And basically, the idea they actually monitor people over time while they're healthy. So we sample them roughly every three months, as shown at the bottom here. And then when an illness comes along, we're trying to understand better what's going on, so we take many more samples, typically five to seven. So again, we're making billions of measurements. So you might say, well, why are we doing all this? Well, we're really trying to understand what does it mean to be healthy? Not when you're sick, when you're healthy. What, is it, what does a healthy person's profile look like? And how does that differ amongst people so uh, that is, um, I guarantee you are all different. Unless you're an identical twin, you're extremely different from the person sitting next to you. Uh, and we're trying to understand that in biochemical terms. We are trying to understand that if a, an illness comes along, why some things are in common. Uh, that is, say, if a, a rhinovirus struck this room, say, most of you would probably get sick, maybe not all. You'd have common symptoms like congestion and things, but some of you might react more severely, get headaches, whatever. Others would. Um, probably have a milder case, and some of you may not get sick at all. So we want to understand why the common, where the common symptoms come from and where uh, individual specific differences come from. And lastly, when you do a study like this, we are going to learn things about people's health as we go along. And so as you heard already, I was actually the guinea pig for the study when we first launched it. It was really to get the technology going. So we started by actually, uh, again, analyzing me, and I've been doing this for a little over eight years now. So I've been through 11 viral infections, I've had Lyme disease, I actually had a bike accident, woke up in a hospital. So I don't go looking for these things, mind you, but uh, if they do happen, I might as well collect good data out of it. That's how I view this whole thing. So, so we sample, again, about every two to three months when I'm healthy. These numbers are days. And then when one of these illnesses, these are co all common colds. This is the first, say, three and a half years of the study, maybe four. Um, and basically, when, a, when an illness comes along, we just take many more samples. So for example, nine months into the study, I had a respiratory syncytial virus. That's a common cold in kids. Uh, and you can see I took many more samples, uh, again, a lot at first, and then spread them out. So that's, that's the general scheme. So we started, in my case, by sequencing my genome. And as Lisa told you, basically, uh, a lot of what we learned from my genome I knew already from my family history. I have um, high risk for um, coronary artery disease. Everyone on my father's side has died of some sort of heart issue, including my father. Um, 
and have, um, uh, what else do I have? I have low incidence for obesity, that's the blue line to the left. Nobody in my family's ever been overweight, that sort of thing. Uh, but there were some surprises. One is, uh, I was predicted to be high risk for basal cell carcinoma. That was a surprise to me. I have two brothers, three sisters, and so when they all came to visit, naturally I took blood from all of them so I could study them too. <laughs> so you better watch it if I ever invite you over to my house there. you. Um, but anyway, we, we profiled, I just happened to mention the two brothers and one sister, what do you know about basal cell carcinomas? Because my genome predicts I have a high risk for that. And it turns out they actually had those events, they were older. And uh, um, so in fact, it was in my family history. And what I like to say is that your genome is a better record of your family history than your family is, right? Because you can learn this from your genome. We don't talk about basal cell carcinomas around the dinner table at my house. So it's very low information transfer. So you don't really learn this information, even though it might be there. But your genome, if you know how to decipher it, can find this out. Anyway, one of the big surprises was high risk for type 2 diabetes. I was not aware of that. And because I was measuring so many things, including my glucose, in fact, I was following it's perfectly normal. But ironically, when I went in for something called a, an insulin resistant test, so insulin resistance is an early form of type 2 diabetes that often gets tested for. I went in for that test here at Stanford, where we had the world's experts. And that's my fasting glucose. I was surprised. It was elevated. It was up much higher than you would normally expect. Um, so I was very surprised. I measured again, came up the same number. Measured a week later, is even higher. And it's arbitrary. Some of you may know this hemoglobin A1C is a measure for high glucose levels, a little more, it's called better for steady state glucose. It's arbitrary, but diabetics are classified as 6.5. And I was 6.4, I was right on the edge. So five weeks later, I went to my general practitioner, measured again, uh, and in fact, 6.7, I was classified as diabetic. That was April 11, 2011. I know that because up until then, I had the world's worst diet. I would eat lemonade and cakes and all that stuff, and I just cut all that stuff out. I had been biking, but I doubled my bike, and I started running, and it took about eight months, and I gradually brought it under control. So this made a big splash at the time because the first time someone used their genome to risk for a disease got the disease, in my case, managed it. It's also quite interesting from a scientific standpoint because when it occurred, it occurred right after that respiratory syncytial virus infection where it's actually fairly sick. So in fact, what we think is going on is that I'm genetically predisposed for type 2 diabetes, and then in conjunction with the vir virus infection, that's what triggered the disease, which has not, uh, it's known viruses are associated with type 1 diabetes, not so clear about type 2. So this is the first evidence that possibly it is there and something we're testing further. So I initially got this under control. It's not a totally happy ending because it turns out, you'll see in a minute we've scaled. We're now studying 105 people. Uh, we've been doing it for about four years. And uh, my had gotten it under control, everything looking fine. So as we scaled this up, um, I stopped kind of looking at the data. I did the perfect control for scientists, which is we were collecting all the data but not looking at it. Then finally somebody looked at it there and said, Mike, do you realize your hemoglobin A1C is back at 7.0? You're diabetic again. I said, oh, I had no idea. So I sampled me a few times. I'd stopped running, ironically, when it spiked up. Uh, and I also, it's not clear, I had another virus infection and also uh, switched my statin, so it's not clear. But I did get it down to 5.7, although that's about two and a half years ago should extend this, but it's actually been creeping up ever since. In fact, it was running around 6.8 for a while. Uh, so I've been back to diabetic again. In fact, I just recently switched to metformin, which is the frontline drug for type 2 diabetes. So uh, the bottom line out of all this is no question I have a glucose dysregulation problem. And so do my brothers and sisters, and they're just as thin as me. We're a little unusual in that sense. Uh, and so we're the so-called thin diabetic category. Um, and it turns out that, um, anyway, we do have a glucose misregulation problem, and it's clearly genetics that's running in our family. All right, um, so we'll see how I'm responding. Uh, uh, it seems to be going down again. So as I mentioned before, we've now scaled this. We're now studying 107 people, and we're doing everything to them that we've been doing to me. So sampling them every three months, and then when an illness comes along or something interesting, like uh, a colonoscopy and all kinds of dietary studies we're running people through, <laughs> We're actually collecting many more samples. And so, uh, as I say, we've been doing this for some time. What I can tell you is that we've gone through 70 people's genomes just like mine. Uh, and um, basically, 12 of those 70 people have some clinically actionable information in them. So you've heard about BRCA mutations, right? Turns out one of the individuals, uh, not aware of it, actually turns out he had a BRCA mutation. Uh, it's a male. 
Uh, and even though he's a male, he is at higher risk for breast cancer and actually prostate and pancreatic cancer. So he's higher risk for that. So he actually will get surveyed more frequently. There were um, several other interesting, important findings there. There were several people who had, actually in total, there were about eight people who were at high risk for cancer. There was another, based on the genome, there was another person who had something called a MODI mutation. So I forgot to say, but about two thirds of our cohort is at risk for type 2 diabetes, or pre-diabetic, and a few diabetics are in our study as well. So one person who had been classified as a, a, as a type 2 diabetic actually had a MODI mutation instead. That's a different kind of diabetes. It's actually a more penetrant genetic form of the disease. It's even higher genetic penetrance. And what that means is that actually turns out he's on the wrong medication. So the way you treat a MODI person is 100% different from the way you would treat a type 2 diabetic. And in fact, um, so the discovery of DNA is very important because the recommendation is he should be switching his medication. In fact, there's a famous story of a type 1 diabetic who late in life discovered they had this MODI mutation, same one actually, uh, and they went and calculated that they had 21,000 insulin injections over their lifetime, and had they discovered early on it was, they were MODI and not type 1, they would have needed a total of zero because they were, on, they were being treated wrong and they never had the right genetic test, which would have occurred decades earlier. So the point out of all this is you really want to understand what the pr thing you're really at risk for and getting so that you are treated properly. And so again, with these 12 people, they have information. You know, it's not always pleasant news to understand you have a BRCA mutation, but it's important news because then you will get you know, surveyed more frequently and, and as a consequence, uh, um, you know, be treated properly. And there's one more interesting example. Sorry I didn't have the slide. But uh, there's a, a young guy who actually has a mutation suggested he's at risk for cardiomyopathy, which is a heart issue. And it turns out his father died of a heart attack, as did his uncle. And uh, after sequencing his genome and seeing this, um, it turns out that we, he did a, something called a stress echo. And it turns out he, in fact, uh, has a heart issue he did, was not aware of. And he's on drugs as a consequence of this. So the point out of all this, the genome sequence helped predict what he was risk for. And because of that, um, we understand uh, he has an issue and, and he's taking drugs, again, to prevent him from having a heart attack. And that will be very, very powerful for him. OK, in addition to that, I want to see if I find it. It's a little unusual to be to miss the last couple of slides. All right, I guess I did lose it. All right, it turns out by profiling this group now for four and a half years, we made 45 major health discoveries, okay? That is to say, in addition to the one person with a heart problem, we have another person with a serious heart problem. Probably all going to go out of here paranoid, but um, <laughs> uh, one person you'll see in a minute has actually, we caught early, has a B-cell lymphoma, uh, so lymphoma, and that was caught early as a consequence of this. There were two people who were diabetic who had no idea when we enrolled them, and eight others became diabetic during the course. I'll show you some of this data in a minute. Uh, it's all kinds of different things. There's a woman who was, had a stroke, and she was given a medication, and her genome said she should not be on that medication because it puts her at high risk for a side effect that actually could cause another stroke. So she's switching her medications as consequences. So this information, which comes from different sources, is very, very valuable for people. We actually found one person who has elevated liver problems. Uh, um, we can see from their biochemical signatures that there's something going on with the liver. That one we still haven't figured out yet, but we know their, their liver functions are off based on these biochemical measurements. So we're keeping an eye on them for that sort of thing. So the bottom line is that all those kinds of data measurements and these longitudinal profiles have been very powerful. So I'll show you a little of this. This is uh, the individual that, this one's picked up by imaging, so about, 40 of our folks have done something called a stress echo, where you run as hard as you can, uh, and then you actually get your heart monitored. And at the same time, we do some extra imaging. This person actually had an enlarged lymphoma and had biochemical measurements that were also consistent with this as well. What was interesting about this case, we could go back and look at their data. There's a very interesting marker, that, and it turns out that was actually on the rise before lymphoma that makes a lot of sense. We actually may have an early marker for lymphoma as a consequence of having done this longitudinal profile. And we're gonna now test this on other folks. So we can see these biochemical changes before they were actually um, detected, before this lymphoma was detected. 
I should point out, in addition to this case, we have another case of someone who has too many IgM cells. It's a precancer, if you will. It's like an early form of lymphoma. They have two, it's called an MGUS uh, phenotype. They have too many IgM cells, a very specific kind of immune cells. And as a consequence of that, uh, they'll be monitored fairly closely because 15% of the time that can turn into an aggressive cancer. So finding these early markers, again, is very, very important. Also, by doing these stress echoes, we actually found six people with uh, cardiac uh, arterial plaques, if you will, in their carotid arteries. Probably hard to see. It may be easier down here, but they'll have little blockages there. And then that's important because basically, especially when you see they're running with high LDL, high cholesterol, they're actually, we press upon them that they should probably manage that a lot better. Uh, none of this is critically that's going to. At the level it's at now, we're not expecting to have them have a heart attack, but if it keeps going the way they're going, that's not a good thing. So this is why you want to catch these things, monitor it, make sure you get it under control. So again, keeping people healthy. This is the di diabetes story. We have a similar story for cholesterol. This is what people thought when they came in. Most people thought they were fine. A few knew they were prediabetic, which is high elevated glucose, this hemoglobin A1C, but not at diabetic levels, and some knew they were diabetic. Just that the day we enrolled them, it turns out a lot of people are pre-diabetic. In fact, it turns out 9 out of 10 people are pre-diabetic and have no idea. Why is that a big deal? 70% of pre-diabetics will become diabetic in their lifetime. So you actually want to know that early. So again, you can monitor and maybe not eat all those extra carbs you were about to eat. Uh, as I say, two people turned out to be diabetic, didn't know it. And then as we went through the course of the study, Others did become diabetic, which we did expect if you follow people over four and a half years. Some of the pre-diabetics will become diabetic. Others will become pre-diabetic. We can actually follow exactly how they're becoming diabetic. This is actually me in that lower corner. So that's my first spike. And then when it came back, uh, it got higher. And different people are becoming diabetic different ways, it turns out. Two people actually gained a lot of weight, became diabetic. And actually, the, so that one looks weight-induced. Other folks, it's not so, they, it wasn't through weight gain they became diabetic, but in fact, their, their fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C went up. And others have become diabetic actually because they're spiking um, um, their glucose after they eat. And there's a way you measure that called an oral, oral glucose tolerance test. So you, there are actually different measures for glucose misregulation. And we run all these, and we can figure out which forms people have. Uh, and, um, that actually affects the treatment they get as well. All right, we actually have a subset of our folks who actually have, have gone through different kinds of studies. One study we did was just to see the effect of weight gain and weight loss on people's biochemical profiles. So we have a group of 23 people, 13 were this insulin resistance, this early form of diabetes. They weren't yet diabetic, uh, and 10 were healthy, and they're matched for weight. And then they, believe it or not, they ate an extra 1,000 calories a day if they're male, 750 if they're female, for 30 days, and gained on average about 6.2 pounds. And then they went on a diet and, and lost weight. And so we measured the beginning, after they gain weight, after they lose weight, and they're part of our study, so we follow them out. And then we see what kinds of biochemical changes go on. And it turns out um, these are the molecules that change each row. So these are molecules that are low initially, go up when they gain weight, go back down. And the top pathway that goes up is, in fact, the inflammation response. So when people gain weight, you'll actually see your immune response goes a bit out of whack, and your inflammation response goes up a lot. The other top pathway that changes is, in fact, your cardiomyopathy pathway gets very altered. So we actually think your heart function changes when you gain weight. That's, it's known people get heart attacks when they gain weight. We think this is a molecular explanation for that. So we can, again, see changes that occur uh, um, when people gain weight, and I'm happy to say virtually all the changes I just mentioned shift back when you lose weight, so you can reverse it quite well. But there are a few changes that seem to persist a bit longer. Um, the other thing we've learned is that everybody's profile is different. So now, no matter what we look at, whether it's your metabolites, whether it's your RNA, whether it's your proteins, we all have distinct signatures. So that is to say we're all unique, we're all special, and not just to our mothers, okay? We're, we're very special people. Uh, what's also very interesting, what we've done by following people over time, they actually don't shift that much. They shift a little bit, but for the most part, your profiles are fairly stable. And I think that's because we're creatures of habit, right? We tend to eat the same foods. Our, our genome and our epigenome tend to keep things stabilized. And so that's probably hard to see here, but each color is a different person, 
and then each dot is a different visit. And you'll see the, the different colors tend to be near each other, and that means they're, they're biochemically s similar for each of these things we're measuring. Okay, the other thing we've been doing more recently, and this started about five years ago, is trying to test the effect of wearables on people's health. So at the time we started this, uh, um, most people, Fitbits were out there. The Apple Watch hadn't come out just yet. But people were um, using Fitbits and measuring steps. And, and you probably heard this. People typically use those devices for about three months, figure out what their patterns are, and then throw it in a drawer. They're kind of done with it, right? How many of you are wearing a Fitbit or smartwatch or something like that? Yeah. So quite a few, yeah. Well, we went out and tested. At the time, there were 500 of these devices, continuous monitors or with portable monitors. We tested about 30 of them. You'll see there's all kinds of monitors out there. I wear eight of these or nine of these every single day. I'm wearing three smartwatches, <laughs> OK? So, so the, new, the new geek thing, by the way, you know how it used to be glasses, uh, tape on the glasses? Now it's tape on the smartwatch. So, um, so anyway, the, these things are pretty incredible. They measure, they, like one smartwatch will make 250,000 measurements in a day, right? They'll, they'll follow all kinds of things. So they'll follow, for example, uh, hard for me to see, but your heart rate, uh, some of the portable devices measure blood oxygen, skin temperature, galvanic stress response, which is sweat on your skin. Uh, they, I have a monitor that measures radiation. I can tell you what it's like right in this room right now. Palo Alto is pretty good, but occasionally you'll see, yeah, it's not bad, um, three millirems per. Uh, um, anyway, there's all kinds of things. Nearly all this information, by the way, will relay into your smartphone. Okay, so your smartphone is your collector of this data. Your, it's a DNA nexus, and it will be your platform for health in the future. So again, you can measure many, many different things. Our cohort is wearing a smartwatch and then a few f apps that are on the smartphone that collect all kinds of different data. Now these, the <clears throat> excuse me, these measurements are great for actually, again, following your baseline health, and the goal is to find deviations from that health. And so just to give you a feel for this kind of data, this is my circadian pattern. So this is sleep, heart rate, and uh, skin temperature, which is different from your core temperature. So I sleep at night. Wake during the day, occasional nap, back to sleep at night. Heart rate, low at night, high during day, back down. Skin temperature, again, different from core temperature, high at night, drops during day, comes back up. So uh, that's my pattern. This is 43 other people's patterns. Everybody has a different resting heart rate, skin temperature, blood oxygen. And I think you know that intuitively. We're all very unique in our baseline measurements. You can also get people's baseline activity measurements. That is to say, here are people are monotonic during the day, not active at night, monotonic during the day, morning people, morning afternoon people, morning afternoon, evening people. So people fall into different activity patterns as well. So again, the goal is to find people's baseline and find then deviations from that. So my biggest deviation, it turns out I fly a lot, I travel a lot, it's a drop in blood oxygen. So this is known already, but your blood oxygen drops on airplanes. I'm not sure how many, how many of you knew that before. Wow, this is a smart crowd. I'll tell you, most people actually don't know that. A lot of pilots don't even know it, believe it or not. So hey, this is a flight from San, Di from San Francisco, San Diego. Green is altitude. Plane goes up, comes down. Uh, blood oxygen high, drops low. That's where they pressurize the cabin, comes back up when you land. What's not so docu well documented is how low does it go and how long is it low. And it turns out 5% of the time, your blood oxygen will drop to 90 or so below, which is a so-so. Uh, and then, but quite a bit of time, this is actually an underestimate. We now know, for me, if that flight's, that flight's up at 31,000 feet, my blood oxygen will be 94 every single time or lower. Okay, So it drops a reasonable amount. So why is that a big deal? Well, it turns out this is also, oh, that's me. We've now measured about 30 people, true for everybody, one exception. If you go, the plane goes up. Uh, Actually, the air pressure drops, and you can measure it exactly. There's a free app called a barometer app. You can measure that on your iPhone. So we now capture that information, too. So you can see exactly. And the, all planes are not the same, by the way. Some drop lower than others, and I can tell you about that later. So bottom line is everybody drops uh, when the plane goes up. What's also not so well documented is what does it mean for you? Well, it turns out it correlates with fatigue. So for me, that magic number is 96. And when the my blood oxygen drops below 96 in a blinded test, I can, I'm tired. And if it's 96 or above, I'm alert. Some exceptions. But in general, that's the, the, the rule. And my reaction time slows down. That's true of everybody. So again, when your blood oxygen drops, your reaction time goes down. So you're tired, uh, we think, on airplanes. 
not because you've been working too hard, not because you've been playing too hard. It's because actually they've dropped the air pressure, your blood oxygen drops, and you're tired. So if you're a workaholic like me, that's extremely disappointing because it means no matter how fired up you are, you sit on that airplane, bam, you're going to get knocked out. But the good news is that actually, uh, at least for me, I can adapt. After seven hours, in fact, my blood oxygen will come back up. So, uh, so this is a flight from Frankfurt to um, San Francisco. And again, plane uh, drops and blood oxygen drops. Uh, go, after seven hours, my blood oxygen comes up back to normal level. So if you're a workaholic, hang in there. You can actually still get work done if the flight's long enough. <laughs> OK. So again, this is kind of amusing from um, you know, a habit point. But here's uh, this turn, information turned out to be extremely valuable for me for figuring out for detecting Lyme disease. So the backstory behind this is I was helping my brother put up fences in rural Massachusetts where 55% of ticks are Lyme infested. Two weeks later, I'm flying to Norway through Frankfurt. And because, as you can tell, I measure myself all the time, I know exactly what my measurement should be. So on this last flight from Frankfurt to Oslo, it's a short flight uh, and not that high. And on those kinds of flights, my blood oxygen normally drops about 96 or so median. And then it comes back up when I land. But on this flight, the median was 90, and it stayed at about 95, 96, even after I landed. I knew something wasn't right. So then I actually got a low-grade fever, and then three days later, went to a doctor in Norway, and I warned him ahead of time it might be Lyme disease, because we were a little worried they didn't know much about Lyme disease there. Brought my wife with me in case we need some Norwegian, which she can speak. And he measures me, pulls out my, cell, uh, my immune cells, and says that my monocytes are up, which means I have a bacterial infection. He says, all right, you have a bacterial infection. I think you should take penicillin. And I said, no, I think I should take doxycycline, which is what you use for Lyme disease. And as you might imagine, it was quite tense for a few moments there. <laughs> okay. He did give in. I, uh, you know, I assured him I wasn't a total quack, although you, may, you guys may think otherwise. But, um, and in fact, this is some of my measures. And, and sure enough, it actually cleared up a day later. So this is, we could, it, it turns out my heart rate was elevated. Uh, I probably forgot to say that. So it was, it was not only my um, blood oxygen, my heart rate went up. And I later learned my skin temperature went up as well. And you can measure by outlying measurements. And so again, this is a schematic my postdoc made. That's when I got infected. I was only there one day, so we know what day I got infected. Um, again, here's when I uh, flew over and uh, first got ill, and then I took doxycycline. Air cleared up. But when I got back, I tested. Sure enough, I was Lyme positive, uh, and I have the perfect control because I given blood. You'll see three days before I left, I was negative, so I'd clearly converted during that time. So it's a very well controlled experiment. No question, I have Lyme disease uh, and not some false discovery. So. The bottom line out of all this is that my sensors were extremely valuable for finding that. So that prompted us to, to look at the two years I was wearing the watch. I've now been doing it for about four and a half years. And we went through and we looked at all the days when I had measurements of my blood and things so we could see what my illness status was. And it turns out there were a total of four periods where I was sick during this time. The Lyme disease period, those are the triangles there, each is a day. Uh, it was kind of low resolution. And there were three other periods as well. It's hard to see. I think there's one over there and two here. Two of them we now know are viral illnesses. And a third was uh, a time I had, it turns out, high CRP, which is an indicator of an illness, but I didn't report being symptomatic. And the bottom line is that every single time I was sick, I had a high heart rate and a high skin temperature, just measured by my smartwatch. Okay. So my smartwatch is seeing these outlying measurements. Again, they're taking 250,000 measurements a day. So they're finding these deviations from your baseline. So that prompted us to write an algorithm where we look for a change in your resting heart rate, OK, as narrow window as possible. This one's a two-hour window. We can now do it for 30 minutes, where we think with a, in a 30-minute change from your resting heart rate, we can tell whether you're sick or not before you know you're sick. Okay, because you don't get symptomatic typically until 30 to 48 hours after you've been infected. But your heart rate, we think, goes up before that. Okay, you might start feeling the illness. So basically what we're trying to do now, and we've tested this on three other people, one of whom got sick twice. Every single time we can see their heart rate went up before they reported being ill. So we're now going to try this for 1,000 and ideally with, with everybody uh, to see if we can roll this out so that your smartwatch will be detecting when your heart rate goes up, relay into your iPhone until you're getting sick, and then we'd flag you back. That's the plan. We're going to start a study. 
that you are getting ill again before you know it. You might start feeling like a little congested. You may say, why is that a big deal? Well, I think it's a big deal if you're especially a caregiver of older folks or like my mom's 90 years old, lives on the East Coast. I'd love to know if she's getting sick, uh, which I could tell here from 3,000 miles away before she, she'd be the last person to tell me she's getting sick. Okay? And my kids, uh, same thing. I'd like to know if they're getting sick early so I don't send them to school and infect everybody else. So this is the kind of thing we think we can do with that information. So we also think, I won't have time, but we think you can see early forms of diabetes by changes in your heart rate as well. And actually now some other measurements we've been doing. So again, your smartwatch is going to be a very, very powerful sensor. And we think if you think about it, your car has 400 sensors on it. The average person has zero. I like to think the person is more important than the car. Some people disagree with that. But the point out of all this is that I think we should have these sensors besides the ones we naturally have that can tell us about illnesses before we're aware of it so we can modulate and try and prevent disease or at least uh, reduce it. So these sensors, once again, they're going to relay uh, basically all into your smartphone. And then your smartphone, we think, is going to be your command center for your health. And so we're writing a dashboard that basically will be, have your health dashboard right on your iPhone, just like your car has a dashboard. That's the goal. We've been doing some of this already, not just with wearables, but your microbiome, all that kind of information we want to display on this dashboard. This dashboard is not only, we think, important for you, but you can relay that information to your physician, who in turn should be able to look at the state. I don't know about you, but when I go to a doctor's office, they measure my heart rate and things for about 15 seconds, maybe a minute. Okay, they make a measurement, and they say, you're fine, go home, or whatever. Okay? You can actually now look at a whole years of data when people say, when are you getting sick? Just look at the data and they'll say, well, you were started getting sick three weeks ago because your heart rate or something went up. So we think these measurements are going to bring health much more accurately. By the way, my doctor's measurements are all over the map because sometimes I bike there, sometimes I have a big grant due that day, so I'm anxious. So the measurements are all over the place. But these measurements are capturing you all the time so you can very easily extract out your daily baselines. Okay. So the overall summary out of this is that I do think genome sequencing is here. I think all of you will have the option of getting your genome sequenced. How many of you have had your genome or exome sequenced already? Wow, this is an amazing crowd. Usually that number is like one or two, okay? So all of you will have that decision uh, available to you, and so it's really up to you how to get it done, what, what information you want to get back and such. And, and we do believe it can be used to manage disease, uh, to, predict, sorry, to predict disease risk and then manage your health. Uh, and I think, again, it'll be powerful. I think it's just one part of the overall thing. I think these other measurements we make, these biochemical measurements about your metabolism and stuff, are um, extremely valuable for determining when things are going off. I think the most important part of all this is that we're capturing people longitudinally, right? We're making your measurements as you go along. So we understand people's baseline uh, measurements and when there's a deviation with something ill coming along, we actually can detect it. Again, we think in some cases, at least before people themselves realize it. And the other part that's very, very important is we're all different. So we really need to make these measurements to you, not relative to the population average, which I would argue is just not the best way to tell when people are going off. Uh, I like to say that this last point's really important. No one can understand their health better than you, not your physician, not anyone else. Again, this may be my last day here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Bottom line out of this, I really do believe that, that, you know, and no, no disrespect, but your physician has like 15 minutes, right, maybe 30 minutes tops to spend with you. You have hours and days and you have many more contacts. So you really do want to take advantage of all that to understand this, uh, to understand what's wrong with your health as best you can. I might point out that in my family, uh, everyone contacts me if something goes wrong. And I don't know anything. I'm a PhD, as you can probably tell. Um, so the bottom line is people contact me when things aren't right, and I don't have any more information than they do necessarily. Now, I may have better contacts. I can call up head of cardiology or something like that, which is useful from time to time. But for the most part, I just Google it up the same as they do uh, and try and figure this thing out. But I do talk to a lot of people to try and understand this. So, and I do think you know, Google and your smartphone are going to be some of your most important uh, things as well. Doctors won't go away, obviously. I think they are important and they can help you manage your health. But I do think we, the point out of all this, we have many av avenues available to us now to help us do this, and I think that will be commonplace in the future. I mean, in the future, your phone will be buzzing you when you, things aren't quite right, just like your car does.
All right, so this is Mike Snyder's future. I envision a world where people will be getting their genome sequenced before they're born. Uh, I do think we'll have other biochemical and other types of measurements as well, smart devices that will help us. And again, we're going to try and shift medicine to predicting people's risks so you can look out for illnesses and things, uh, and really shift things to predicting risk early diagnosis rather than waiting for people to get ill and treating them later. So I've been extremely fortunate to have an amazing lab uh, here at Stanford. It's literally about 100 feet away, right over there. Uh, and I have really super collaborators. I think it's one of the amazing strengths of Stanford. Uh, my clinical collaborator is Tracy McLaughlin, and here's some talented people in her group. Uh, George Weinsack at the JAX Lab. John Bernstein helps a lot with the genomics. And we are funded by the NIH to do a lot of this work. We actually count a lot on philanthropy and others as well to really carry out a project like this. And then these are some of the key people in my lab, Wen Yu Shao, Brian Pining in particular, and Kevin Contrapa have done a lot of the work that I mentioned. And lastly, I'm going to give you a very shameless plug for my book. Uh, uh, it makes great presents, so feel free to order lots of copies. Uh, it's really not actually meant to make money. You'll see it's dirt cheap. It's really meant to um, really get this information out to people because I do believe that people won't adopt what they don't understand. They tend to be fearful of it, and I think the reality is this information is all coming at us like a fire hydrant, uh, gushing water, and I think we really do have to uh, be on top of it and if we want to manage our health better. It's an amazing time, as I say. So I think I've left plenty of time to answer questions, so uh, let's fire away, and we've got some over here. Looks like I think you're supposed to wait for the microphone if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I understand that um, Alzheimer's is an increasingly costly um, health care system issue. Is there um, a good reason to try to get your genome sequenced to find out if you are at risk for early onset of Alzheimer's? And then secondly, you know, I don't know much about CRISPR technology, but people are starting to talk about that as a possible cure once you, you know, know that you've got either early onset or later onset of Alzheimer's. Sure. So in terms of Alzheimer's, there's early form of Alzheimer's, very certain gene mutations that really put you at extremely high risk. And if it's running in your family, people will test for that. There's also what are called less penetrant mutations, mutations that do put you at higher risk, and they're quite common in the population. Uh, so for example, um, there's a particular allele you may have, it's called APOE gene is the gene that's the more late onset form. And, um, Males, for example, typically, well, males without that still have a 17% chance of getting Alzheimer's. If they have one copy of their genome with the bad allele, they go to 25%, and with two copies, they go to 60%. So you can see this. People in our study, some have asked about their Alzheimer's status. I mean, realistically, you can't do a whole lot now. There are certain, you know, people say exercise your brain and things like that. There are people trying to do this. In the long term, people are trying to do these changes. Nobody's doing it yet because changing people's brain cells is not trivial. Uh, the CRISPR technologies um, and, and other gene editing technologies, they're good. they are very interesting, very powerful, uh, potentially. They're being used more for blood-related diseases. For example, if you can knock out the AIDS receptor, you might prevent the AIDS uh, if you do that in someone's immune cells, which you can do because you can change it in a, tish, in a culture dish and put them back in. You can actually try and block AIDS spreading in a person's body and making them resistant. Um, but it's still too early for most of these other sorts of, of treatments. And they're very creative ideas. And, and you've mentioned some people are doing these kinds of things in mice. Uh, I'm not aware of trials for Alzheimer's with CRISPR. It doesn't mean they aren't there, but I'm not aware of any. So, uh, but they will come down the road, but we need, there's safety still a big issue. There's a lot of issues with CRISPR. It's still being explored. Okay, I'm not sure who's next. I'll let you guys. Hello. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, there's a number of uh, genome testing services out there. I wanted to know, is there a preferred one for <laughs> <laughs> figuring out what you're predisposed to, or are they all the same? And can you get a printout of what your genome is? Or a, or a yes, uh, so you can definitely, um, there are uh, services. There's Veritas, Genos, and Helix that will all do this. Um, they usually involve a physician in some fashion, but you basically order the service, and they, uh, at least two of them will give you all the information they have. So Veritas will give you your whole genome. Genos gives you just where your genes are. It's called your exome. And uh, they give you back reports. Now, here's where, uh, you know, you're talking to an aficionado. So 
we think there's only two groups that are really, really good at interpreting genomes comprehensively. That, that would be the groups here at Stanford, our lab, you and Ashley, and others, naturally. Uh, but in fairness, there's also another group that does spend a lot of time on this at Harvard. <laughs> Uh, who's almost as good as Stanford, but no, just kidding. Um, the, the point is that they, I think those two groups do a good job. The companies give you some information back. I don't think they, they have necessarily quite the same depth that, that we do as we go through it. So there, there is the, so it is available. So I can say if you want to do it, you can do it. You might then consult some experts about the meanings. That's the hardest part. What, are the, what do the results mean? Uh, you probably want to talk to a genetic counselor both before you do that and after you get the results back in terms of what, what it means. So, uh, but that it is out there and now thousands of people have had their genome sequenced. Oh, Illumina is another company. I forgot that. Yeah. Okay. I have a comment and then a question. I just flew back from um, Stockholm back and forth and Norwegian Air, they, when you uh, give you the instruction, they said we are on a 787, a special ca pressurized cabin that mm -hmm. would make you recover faster. So it has probably something to do with what you were talking about. Yeah, the party line is that in standard commercial aircraft, it's pressurized at 8,000 feet, and in the 787, it's supposed to be 6,000. I can tell you personally, it's all over the map, and I'll, I encourage you, just download this barometer app. You can measure exactly <laughs> what it is, very accurate. I will fix that. And uh, I can tell you, the 737s drop much more than the 757s. We haven't pulled all the data together. I'll give you the exact numbers in a few months. We're pulling all the data together, but they're not all the same. I guarantee that's the case. So and, my question- that doesn't mean the 787, it is better on average. But it, I'm not so sure it's better than the 757s, to be honest. And so, it. <laughs> so it's very interesting. They're all a little bit different. So the question I have is that um, we were told we shouldn't be wearing a lot of these um, gadgets because it's bad for you and you can get cancer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <that's, laughs> yeah. The whole yeah, electromagnetic radiation thing there, yeah. So there, uh, there, I'm told there are 23,000 studies out there on this topic. I'm not kidding you. It's an amazing number. And they're all over the map. Now, I'm biased, but the ones I've seen aren't very convincing to me. So uh, that's why I'm wearing eight of these devices. And <laughs> I'm totally getting zapped. And now you may say, look, I'm living proof they cause problems. But uh, I like to think that um, I'm semi-normal. But um, yeah. uh, OK, yeah. Um, I have two questions. Number one, do you have a, um, well, one is, do you have a room for more, one more volunteer in your study? <laughs> <laughs> and the second question is, what is the best uh, smart watch? Yeah, it's a great, they're both great questions. So the, the reality is we will actually be enrolling people for this infectious disease study, so that, and that should be easy. Uh, if you own a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, that's how we're trying to roll that out. But you will have to own those because we can't buy them for everyone, unfortunately. So we will do that. We also have a continuous glucose monitoring study going on, too, where because I didn't tell you this, but I'm wearing, a, as you might imagine, the, there are these new devices that tell you, they measure your glucose all the time. So I know exactly what a banana does to my <laughs> glucose levels. I kid you not. No, and it's all there. It's very fascinating because we all react differently through our microbiome is a big part of it, but we react differently to different foods. So what you want to do is keep away from your foods that spike your glucose and say the others. So we are running a study with that, and you're welcome to join that one too. So uh, I think I have some cards here. I'm happy to give them out. For this deep omics profile, as you might imagine, it's extremely expensive. So we're, we're as once we get our next grant or whatever, we're, then we'll try and, and continue the, the study as well as add more individuals. That's the goal. It's just like yours. I'm 6.4, 6.7. Uh -huh. I've been stuck for the last 15 years. I've done everything food-wise, health-wise, exercise right. regularly. I'm stuck there. Yeah. I, I, I'm exactly like you. I have the same problem. I tried everything. I, I heard about, you know, you can't tell. But I heard about uh, muscle mass being better for glucose homeostasis. So for the last 20 months, I've been pumping Wait, that's what, so like I can say, you can't tell. But um, believe it or not, I've actually, because I'm doing MRIs and stuff, I know exactly, I've gained uh, nine pounds of muscle during this time. So you should have seen me before. Um, 
anyway, the, the point out of all, but it didn't work. I just kept, for me, I just kept going up. So it didn't work for glucose control. It's been great for other things, so I keep it up. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Oh, smartwatch, yeah. Unfortunately, one we like the best is called an, uh, a basis, but they pulled it from the market because it overheated in 0.2% of people. Uh, so, um, and it was bought by Intel. That's not their core business. So they pulled that watch. We, the, there's a very expensive one called Empatica that's pretty good. It measures lots and lots of stuff. Um, so the most common ones are, in fact, Apple Watch and Fitbit. Um, our cohort is wearing Fitbit because it is measuring certain things we're interested in. The, the, yeah, so we're using that. But I don't know which one. They're all competing with each other, which is great, because then we'll get more and more features on them. Um, I like the Fitbit because it also charges in 15 minutes, which is really nice. So there are these. You, you have to see a little bit. So anyway, that's the one we're using now. There are tricks for getting the data, though, that's tricky. Yeah. Anyway. Or move to the next question. Oh, okay. Hi, Dr. Snyder. Hi. First of all, thank you for a very, very interesting talk and sharing so much of your intimate genome <laughs> details with us. Yeah. Um, my question is actually, how do you address the conundrum of uh, knowing that something is going to happen and then waiting for it to happen? Because in, in, in your presentation, you mentioned about this, uh, I think one of the subjects who is about 10 to 15 percent uh, of a chance of developing cancer. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, for that person, just to know that, hey, I might get cancer, uh, knowing that information, uh, how does that if impact their quality of life? Because right. there's nothing that they can do about it, unlike for the diabetes, where you could do something about it. Yeah, so interesting that you should say that. Now, I'm a researcher. My reaction, if I heard that, would be, suck out my immune cells now with the <laughs> pre-cancer, no, this is serious, uh, and save them aside. Because if I do get cancer, I'd rather have, and then get rid of the ones that are overgrowing a bit, and put the others back, because I'd rather have the pre-cancer cells put back. The, the way it's done now is, if you get cancer, le leukemia, mm -hmm. they will actually do what I just said. They, they'll pull out your stem cells, try and find the ones that aren't cancerous, irradiate right. your chemicals to get rid of the rest, and add them back. And it works most of the time. But you'd actually be better working with the pre-cancer version, wouldn't you, if you think about it? Mm -hmm. So that might, I don't know if that's an option. I'm just throwing this out there. So I'm not an MD. By the way, you should ignore everything I told you the last hour. <laughs> but that would be one thing you could consider. But I think the biggest part of this is that what you would do is you'd follow yourself, just like all these cancerous, just like BRCA. Just monitor yourself more frequently. All of you use your family history to manage your health right now. You all know you're at risk for something. We all are, right? Nobody's going to live to be... 1,050 years old. So you're all at risk for something. It's a matter of knowing what you're risk for and, and then keeping an eye out for those things so you catch it early. The problem is when you catch disease late, it's very, very difficult to reverse. So the name of the game is catch it early. And I think that's where this information is valuable. Now, if it freaks you out where every day you wake up yeah. and you worry about getting cancer or Alzheimer's, that is a quality of life issue. And then maybe you don't want that information, especially information you can't do anything about. Right. You may not want that. Right. Uh, I also had a follow-up question. What about privacy and other things? Because a lot of this data, when it's out there and it's shared, you can potentially get it shared with insurance companies, and they say, hey, you're at risk for this, so your premium is likely right. to be much more than what it would be otherwise. Right. So by the way, my genome is out there. You can all download it and take a look at it. <laughs> if you see anything interesting, let me know. And most our cohort has agreed to make their data open, too. Um, so it is, we are protected for health insurance and for um, employment from genetic discrimination. It's a GINA Act that's out there. We're not protected for long-term disability or for life insurance. So that can be used against you. Uh, I would argue it's so better to know what you're at risk for and have your life insurance go up than otherwise. That's my own feeling. That may not be everyone's feeling. So I do think the information is valuable. On the privacy thing is, you know, I think you are the owner of your information. I really do believe that. You own your genetic information. You should own all the information, just like you should own your own doctor's report. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my own view is in a, now I'm Pollyannish in that sense. I believe that in a country like that's fairly wealthy, like the United States, everybody should have some basic level of insurance and coverage, including long term. Mm -hmm. Uh, disability. So to me, I think that's just something we should do as a, as a civilized nation. Um, that's Thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. First is, I have seven siblings, so together we have eight. Is there a benefit to do the genomic sequence for eight of us and compare and predict 
what kind of disease each of us will have, will acquire later in our life? Uh, so the answer is yes, especially if some of them have somewhere in your family, either from your parents or, or grandparents, or from um, um, some of your siblings, if there is a disease running in their life, you know, breast cancer is a classic, where it's if your mom and your grandmom had breast cancer, there's a chance that uh, there's a, a gene like BRCA that is causing that. And by sequencing you, know, you and others, you could actually see that. So family members are helpful. It also helps us in cases of rare disease where an individual might develop a rare disease and we can go back and figure out what the cause is. I didn't talk about that, but we actually take on a lot of those cases as well where we sequence people with these rare diseases and try and figure out what's wrong. And large family members help us by knowing who has it, who doesn't and then looking at their genome to make that correlation, ah, oh, we think that mutation is causing that disease. It turns out to be very, very helpful. Yeah, so I think, oh, we get one more question. I don't know what you want. One more question, one more question. yes. I don't know who the regulator is. Is this okay? The, uh, I'll stay around afterwards, by the way, so I'm happy to talk to others who might have questions as well. Dr. Snyder, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Sure. Uh, question in regards to epigenetic markers. Um, I read a study a couple years back that especially the Holocaust survivors and their grandchildren, how epigenetic markers indicated there was a strong change in the phenotypic expression in regards to metabolism. So I was curious if there was a lot of progress made on, on the ability to map those markers for us as consumers to know what those um, how our genetic prof uh, how our genes were being expressed with our epigenetics. Yeah, so epigenetics is really fascinating. It is affected by the food you eat, exercise, etc. So there's a lot of interest in this. In fact, one of my favorite studies is they had a study in Sweden where they had 23 people biking with one leg but not the other for three months, four times a week, 45 minutes a, a, a period. And then they looked at the modified DNA in this. So, you, so epigenetics comes in several ways, but one is your DNA can get modified, chemically modified, methyl groups. And it turns out they found 4,000 differences between the biking leg and the non-biking leg. So in fact, you know exercise is good for you, but the reason this is powerful is that it says, I mean, it really is chemically modifying your DNA. Uh, and it, now, the other reason it's a big deal is the way it modifies DNA, it's known to be associated with changes in the way your genes are are active or not. So your genes can become more active when they're uh, not modified and less when they're modified. So these 4,000 differences are probably affecting health in some fashion. That part isn't clear, so it's still being researched. Something we're studying a lot, I actually took those slides out, but it turns out when we look at my modified DNA during the first three and a half years of the study, um, during the viral infections, my, most of my biochemical markers just jumped up and down every single time. My modified DNA only changed twice it's a two times my glucose went off that I showed you before. So we actually think your modified DNA is a marker of chronic disease, whereas these other biochemical measurements are more um, acute disease. So we actually think this epigenetics, I don't know if that was clear, but it's gonna be very, very powerful for following chronic disease. It's just too early days, so it's not clinically, it's not actionable to the way the genome is just yet, although stay tuned. I think, it, I think your epigenome is gonna be more powerful than your genome, and I'm chair of genetics, so this is a, a big deal, we think. Okay, I think we're done now, right? Yeah. Great, so thanks very much.